Well, good morning. Really cool to have you here, man. Uh, what we're going to do today is go over the last, what I consider to be kind of lecture-heavy chapter, which is chapter 17. This area is on electrochemistry, and electrochemistry is just where electricity and chemistry come together. And batteries, for example, in my remote control, batteries are a great example of this area, all right? And we all use batteries in phones and calculators and watches and stuff like that. Uh, that's where this chapter really comes into play. We'll talk about equilibrium, how it affects batteries. We'll also talk about thermodynamics, stuff like that, uh, see what's going on. Um, Wednesday, <clears throat> problem set number five, we'll look over, and that's kind of the last of what I consider to be I mean, the last real intense problem set. The titration of weak acids lab is due, and then bring a printed copy of the lab with the longest name, determination of KSP, delta G, delta H, delta S for calcium hydroxide lab, and <clears throat> it's kind of a nice lab. Friday, by 9 o'clock, quiz number 5 will be due. Uh, it will be released on Wednesday. This quiz has extra credit built in, so the more time you spend on this, the more chance you get. Quiz 5 is technically worth 20 points, but there's a total of 40 points. So if you get more than 20 points, extra credit. So if you have time, I encourage you to check it out. No deal. And then finally, what I realized uh, here just recently is that next week, Monday, is actually our last lecture for this class. Um, that's the ninth week next week, and the tenth week is Memorial Day, which is cool. So we won't have a lecture that day. Um, we'll talk more about what the schedule is going to be like uh, coming up, but just FYI on that. Any questions before I start? Sweet. Um, this chapter is kind of fun. It's a lot different than the chapters that we've looked at so far. Most of what we've looked at so far in Chem 221 through Chem 223 involves either an atom being transferred or a group of atoms being transferred. And as a classic example, the acetic acid reaction, acetic acid plus water making acetate plus hydronium, I would consider this to be a time where an atom is transferred. Like all of the Bronsted acid-base problems, hydrogens here are being transferred, so hydronium gets the H+, plus, and OAC-, minus, the acetate ion, is left over. And most of what we've looked at has involved this kind, all right? This is where you have atoms being transferred or groups being transferred. But in this chapter, we're going to come back to something that we looked at briefly in Chem 221, which is when electrons are transferred between different atoms or molecules. This is an example of this process. So notice here how copper uh, is neutral. There's no positive or negative charge. And on the other side, we have copper 2 plus. And that means in this case that this copper, which is this one right here, has lost two electrons. Uh, chemists call this version of copper elemental copper. This version right here would be the version you see if you have like a copper wire or something like that hanging out. This is the copper 2 plus ion, and to make a solid out of that, you'd have to have something else around. Now, conversely, silver plus is on this side, and silver plus goes to neutral silver. This version of silver on the product side would be the silver of like necklaces or rings or things like that made of silver. It's elemental silver. Well, this is the ion. So if you think about this long enough, Copper is becoming more positive, and silver is becoming less positive. So the thing that's becoming more positive is ending up losing electrons, and it's becoming more positive. Like copper normally has 29 protons, 29 electrons. On this side over here, copper has lost two of those. It still has the 29 protons, but it only has 27 electrons. Those electrons have to go somewhere. They don't exist very well by themselves. So the electrons are transferred to the silver ions. Now silver only needs one electron to become neutral. So notice that there are two silver ions here going to two silvers. Because copper has lost two electrons, those two electrons have to go somewhere. And one electron goes to each silver plus to make silver. So this latter reaction, which we call redox reactions in Chem 221, this is an electron transfer reaction. 
all right? Like you don't have like the hydrogen ion being transferred between the acid and the base or something like that. This is true electrons being transferred. And this is the kind of stuff we're gonna focus on in this chapter. It's a nice way to end Chem 223 uh, because it brings a lot of the ideas into play that we've talked about. So electron transfer reactions can always be broken up into two parts. And one part will have electrons on the product side, and one part will have electrons on the reactant side. And this is really important. Uh, electrons don't just disappear into the void normally. <laughs> normally. In, this, in this chapter, they won't. We have to account for them. They have to go somewhere. So in this problem, the copper has lost electrons to make copper 2+. In this part down here, the silver plus ions have gained electrons to make silver metal. So we'll talk about breaking these up into the half reactions as we go through. Half reactions are a time where chemists are allowed to show electrons. We don't, well, we never actually show electrons in the full reaction, all right, but we will show them in the half reactions. And if it's a good half reaction, then eventually the product electrons and the reactant electrons will be the same. And we'll talk about that here. All right, so electron transfer reactions technically are called oxidation reduction, or because that's too many consonants, redox reactions. So a redox reaction is more about the electrons going from one atom or compound to another instead of the atoms going from one to the other. Now, the thing about redox reactions that we haven't talked about so far is that because electrons are going from one species to another, the electrons are moving. And electricity, which is basically electric current, is nothing more than moving electrons. So if you do a redox reaction correctly, you can have controllable electricity, controllable electric current. And that's what makes electrochemists uh, kind of high in demand in industry. You can actually have electrons to do good work with them. We'll talk about that. So electrochemistry is basically the control of redox reactions. So you know then how many electrons, if you will, are going from one reactant to the other. Um, you can also control those electrons in knowing and uh, making other things possible. And you also know the chemicals that go together that make electricity. Not all chemical combinations will make electricity. You have to find the right kind of ones. And those are the things that we'll look at in this chapter. Now, <laughs> what's oxidation anyway? Gee, I don't know. My science is a little rusty. Bum, bum, bum. Keep my day job. Rust is basically iron going to iron 3 plus, all right? Iron going to iron 3 plus is oxidation. And we'll talk about formally what oxidation is. But I put this up here because in Chem 221, uh, redox was one of the things that, at least with me anyway, that we studied. And if you don't remember or you didn't study it, we'll go over all of it again. But redox is reduction and oxidation. And iron going to rust is a form of oxidation. So now you know my cheesy joke. All right. So uh, oxidation is the loss of electrons. All right. So when iron goes to iron plus three, it has lost electrons. And in Chem 221, uh, we talked about oxidation numbers. And if you remember, that means, for example, iron is zero going to iron plus three, that would be an increase in oxidation number. Now, if oxidation numbers are not something you remember, it's totally cool. I've got alternative ways to do all this stuff without knowing oxidation numbers. But the official way that people talk about, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, oxidation, losing electrons. So something is losing electrons, becoming more positive. Reduction is the opposite. Reduction is gaining electrons. And again, we have another yin-yang kind of thing going on here with oxidation and reduction. Something loses electrons and the other piece has to gain electrons, all right? So oxidation and reduction are complementary. You have to have both to have a redox reaction. Um, 
Oxidizing agent is a term that's used, and again, I uh, I don't like this term, but again, I'm just the messenger here. I didn't have anything to do with it. An oxidizing agent is something that's reduced, and when you talk with people, for example, in uh, the automotive department here at Mount Hood, which I have done, they'll a lot of times talk about something being oxidized, and I have to realize they're talking about an oxidizing agent, not something being oxidized. So technically, oxidation means losing electrons. The oxidizing agent is something that's being reduced. It's allowing something else to be oxidized. And I dislike this terminology, but again, I, I didn't make this. This is just old stuff. So if you see oxidizing agent, it means reduction. If you see reducing agent, it means oxidation. All right, and again, I'm sorry about this, but this is something that I run into all the time and stuff. So I love this little meme right here because it's true. Reducing agent is oxidized and the oxidizing agent is reduced. Go figure. So anyway, uh, just FYI, these are some of the terms we'll talk about. Oxidizing and reducing agent are the same. Reducing or reduction and oxidizing agent are the same. Any questions? Now in Chem 221, I introduced you to my friend Leo the Lion, and Leo the Lion says, Grr! <laughs> All right, sound effects and maybe a little extra caffeine enthusiasm not needed, but Leo says GUR is a nice little acronym for remembering what oxidized and reduced means. So Leo is lose electrons oxidized, and GUR is gain electrons reduced. So oxidized and reduced are always in terms of a reactant. So think about oxidized and reduced in terms of the reactant. So in this first reaction right here, zinc has lost electrons. Electrons are products. So we would say that the zinc is oxidized. Uh, in this reaction, the reactant copper 2 plus is gaining two electrons. Electrons are reactants. So we would say that copper 2 plus is being reduced. Zinc would also be known as the reducing agent. Copper 2 plus would also be known as the oxidizing agent. But I'm going to stick with the mostly uh, true chemistry interpretation of how oxidizing and reduction means. You might have seen the oil rig acronym, which is fine too. Oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. I personally don't care for that one as much as my cool lion, but you can use whatever you want and stuff. Just remember that oxidizing is losing electrons, reduction is gaining the electrons, and you always look at the reactant to figure it out. You don't look at the products. Any questions? So in this problem, it says what species is being oxidized in the following reaction? And we've got nickel metal, it's reacting with silver ions, and the products are nickel 2 plus and silver metal. So if you see a question like this, something being oxidized, something reduced, it's always a reactant, all right? So it's not going to be nickel 2 plus or silver, all right? It's always a reactant. And in this case, if something's being oxidized, it's losing electrons. So if something loses electrons, will it be more positive or less positive than it started from? Yeah. It'll go from uh, oxidized means lose electrons, and electrons are negative. So it'll be less negative or more positive. So for example, Nickel, metal, going to nickel 2 plus versus 2 silver, going to 2 silver metal. When I say more positive, less positive, I'm focusing on the reactions which are similar to their products. And notice how the nickel metal doesn't have a charge. But the nickel on the other side has a charge, and it's more positive than what it came from. So things that are more positive have lost negative electrons. So in this case, 
that two electrons that are lost make this, which was neutral, become more positive. So when something has lost electrons, it becomes more positive. In this case, then, the nickel would be the part that's being oxidized. Notice how these reactions. Nickel was neutral, there was no charge. And when I filled in the electrons, positive 2 plus negative 2, this also goes to 0. This is a really neat thing about reactions. If you haven't seen this before, the charge on the reactant side should equal the charge on the product side. Now, most of the time we haven't needed this because we haven't done that many redox reactions, but in this case, that's going to be really important. Now, down here, if you look at the silver, you can see that silver metal has no charge, and here we have 2 times plus 1, we have positive 2. So the name of the game in a lot of this chapter is going to be you can add electrons. You can't subtract them, but you can add them. And you want to add electrons to the side which is more positive. So if I add two electrons to the reactant side here, I've got two times positive one and two times negative one. You add those charges together and it goes to zero as well. So when you see, when you're being asked about something being oxidized, the species will become more positive. Like if you look at the product side versus the reactant side, the product is more positive because it's lost electrons. On the other hand, when something's reduced, it becomes less positive. Like here we had positive two from the silvers, and here silver doesn't have anything. So the silver has become more negative or less positive because it added the electrons inside. And that's a really cool way to kind of find out what's being oxidized and reduced. So we would say here that the nickel is being oxidized and the silver plus is being reduced. Any questions on that? If you were to look at the acetic acid example I showed earlier, um, you would have no species going more positive, more negative, so you wouldn't be able to see, and there would, that's, those aren't redox reactions. But in this case, you can definitely see that like nickel's changing its charge, and the silver is changing its charge, and that's a nice way sometimes to test yourself and make sure you don't go with redox. All right. Copper metal reacts spontaneously with a solution of silver nitrate. A coating of silver metal forms on the copper, while copper 2 plus ions, which are blue in water, are released into the solution. Not quite sure why the sound was so weird there, but that's okay. Um, this is an example of a, what's called a direct redox reaction. And let's just look at this part for a second. Redox is again when electrons go from one species to the other. Notice here how copper metal on the left is becoming more positive. Silver ion, silver plus, is becoming more neutral. It's, going, it's becoming less positive. So right away we know that this is a redox reaction. Copper is becoming more positive, just like nickel was becoming more positive. So copper here is being oxidized. The silver plus ions, on the other hand, are going to silver neutral. So we would say that the silver plus is being reduced, it's gaining the electrons. Um, this is redox because electrons are being transferred. It's a direct redox because in this case, in a beaker, there was a piece of copper metal and silver nitrate solution, which is the liquid that turns your fingers black if you don't wash it off right away. Anyway, you let it sit for a while, and the silver ions essentially take electrons from copper. And this kind of mossy looking stuff, this is the silver metal that's formed. Uh, silver metal for necklaces and rings and stuff has to be uh, processed a lot. This is like raw silver metal that pops up. Um, the blue liquid is indicative of copper 2 plus ions too, so you know that this is happening. But anyway, a direct redox reaction just means that electrons are being transferred at the surface, in this case, of the copper metal. So the 
silver ions come up to the surface of the copper, they transfer their electrons, that's why the silver kind of gets on there. The copper ions float away and make the kind of blue liquid. And a lot of chemical redox reactions are this way. You put the chemicals in direct contact with each other, the percent yields are usually really high. Uh, there's a lot of value inside that. This is an example, uh, this is a more detailed example of what's happening. Here's the copper metal. Silver nitrate looks just like water, all right? Don't drink it, kids, but anyway, it is, it looks just like water. Anyway, the silver ions, which here are these kind of white plus ions, then hit up the copper metal. So this is the uh, full, probably, I think it's FCC kind of a lattice of copper metal. And right on the surface, those silver ions are stealing electrons from the copper to make the silver metal. And in the process, the copper ions then float away. It should be copper 2 plus, but that's okay. Anyway, so that's why the copper metal, uh, uh, that's what the direct contact, the silver metal forms on the copper because that's where the electron transfer occurs. And then the blue ions, which are this blue color, these are these little guys, uh, begin to get more and more intense over time. So some chemicals are actually made this way. They put the chemicals in contact with each other. It's really awesome. You usually have really high percent yields. Any questions? But in this problem, there's no control over how the electrons flow from the site of oxidation, the copper, to the site of reduction, the silver. And if you can control the electrons, that's when you can start thinking about electricity and stuff like that. So an indirect redox reaction is basically where you have a redox reaction, it's ready to go, but you control when the electrons are on and off. Now this is nothing more than a battery with a little light bulb on it. And the light bulb uh, lights up when the electrons start happening, all right? And if you look down here on the battery, there's a negative terminal and a positive terminal. Now electrons are negative, and when negative and negatives come together, they tend to get away from each other. So in the batteries, every time you see a negative terminal, if you look real carefully, they almost always have one. Electrons flow from the negative, they're getting away from the negative, and going towards the positive terminal. In this case, though, there's a switch. So maybe we don't want our battery on all the time, so that's like right now it's off. But then, oh, I want to see the light, so you turn it on. The light is on when electrons are transferred over. And you can use, for example, a piece of copper metal. Copper is really good about transferring electrons. Gold is good too, but of course it's more expensive and a couple other metals. But anyway, this is a controllable electric current now going through. It's the same as the copper-silver example we saw earlier. It's just that this time we control when, that, when it happens and when it don't, when it doesn't happen. And this has a lot of potential, excuse the pun, as you'll see, but it has a lot of potential for making chemical change and other kinds of things happen that we wouldn't normally happen. When you plug something into an electric outlet, you're basically flipping the switch, all right? So a vacuum cleaner, you plug it in, you flip the switch on the vacuum. That's like doing this part, you're controlling it. Electricity goes through, makes the vacuum work, you flip it off, you're good to go. Uh, this is a true chemical transformation, sometimes it's physical, but this is pretty exciting when it comes to science, the control of electric current. Any questions about that? So the next time you see a battery, look for the negatives and positives. And remember, electrons will always go from the negative to the positive. Electrons want to stay away from negative things. That's what the negative terminal means. And they want to go towards the positive part. So when you put a battery in, remote control, phone, whatever, vacuum, uh, that's what's happening. You're basically controlling the electron flow. So why study this stuff? I think it's pretty obvious. Batteries are number one in my opinion, but there's many other things to do too. Batteries become more important, it seems like, with time, not less important. So Ds and 9 volts and AAAs and all those kind of things are all just batteries. They're all chemical reactions ready to start happening, but they, nothing will happen until they actually, uh, until the switch is flipped, if you will. 
Now, another problem, though, that's really important for electrochemistry is corrosion. And in the Navy, this is a big concern because seawater is huge in being able to rot through metals. And if they have, for example, different zinc pieces in the water, it keeps the ships better. Um, if, even if you leave your car out in the ocean, especially, it will begin to rust. So things like this will help you understand why it's rusting and maybe think of ways and how to avoid it. A lot of the chemicals that we use at Mount Hood and in our daily lives have to be made through electrochemistry. And sodium hydroxide and aluminum are the two biggest ones, in my opinion. Uh, sodium hydroxide is used in Drano and stuff like that. And of course, aluminum, aluminum cans. Aluminum metal doesn't occur naturally, but with electrochemistry, you can make it pretty readily, which is really cool. And of course, drinking from cups and stuff makes it important. But gosh, probably more important than anything, of course, is living. <laughs> and the heme group in our body is basically absorbing oxygen. It's an electrochemistry kind of transfer process as the oxygen goes to the iron and then it's released later on. That's biological electrochemistry, which of course is probably more important than everything else I've said. But anyway, there's a, this stuff is pretty relevant. A lot of uses for it and stuff. All right, so an electrochemical cell is something we'll talk about. And that's just a kind of a black box apparatus that allows you to have the control over how electrons are transferred. And we'll look at examples of electrochemical cells pretty soon. Now, there's two types of electrochemical cells. And the difference is, is the reaction product favored or is the reaction reactant favored? And we're going to focus most of our time on product favored reactions because when you plug one of those into your remote control or phone or whatever, something happens, all right? So a voltaic or galvanic cell is just a fancy name for an electrochemical cell that works, all right? You plug it in, it's going to happen. Every battery you buy from Fred Meyers and Home Depot and places like that, those are all voltaic galvanic cells in the battery. And that just means the battery is going to work, all right? And that probably seems like a duh, but believe it or not, reactant favored electrochemical cells are important too. And those are things you put them together and nothing happens initially. However, if you can apply electric current to it, then chemicals will be made. And this is what happens when you make aluminum. If you put all the chemicals together to make aluminum, nothing happens initially because you have to add electricity. But once you do add electricity, then pure aluminum is made. And the same thing with sodium hydroxide and sodium metal and chlorine and fluorine gas. A lot of these chemicals, they need electricity to happen. So in this class, like I said, we're going to focus mostly on the batteries that work, all right? Voltaic galvanic cells. But we'll talk briefly about the reactant favored ones, electrolytic cells, because that's how a lot of the chemicals around us are made, stuff like that. Any questions? Yeah, Jeff, what is Volta? and galvani is where voltaic and galvanic cells came from. And these are both uh, Italian names after Italian scientists from the 1700s, which is just crazy. But anyway, both of these people are really interesting uh, individuals and stuff like that. Volta and Galvani, you can read about them. They're pretty interesting. They were really helpful in getting electrochemists, uh, electrochemistry up to speed. But in my opinion, the most famous one is, of course, Dr. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. If you've seen Young Frankenstein, you'll appreciate this. And if you haven't, then I apologize for wasting your time. Gene Wilder. Uh, move on. <clears throat> to understand how batteries work, all right, we need to be able to balance equations for redox reactions. And the first big goal of this section is to learn how to balance a redox reaction. So this is going to be the reaction between potassium permanganate, which is kind of a purple color, and this is an iron plus three solution. And the reaction is permanganate. This is the permanganate polyatomic ion. It reacts with five iron two pluses. It needs a little bit of acid. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway, the permanganate is turned into a manganese plus two. 
the iron plus two is turned into an iron plus three, and water appears as well. So right away we can tell that this is a redox reaction because the iron has changed charges. And it's easy to see, positive two in my world is a lot different from positive three. And by the way, you've got to start writing all charges for ions. I've been kind of ramping this up slowly, and if I took points off on you, I apologize, but it's to get you ready for this chapter. A positive two iron is a lot different than a positive three iron. So make sure you write the ion charges all the time. If you look at this manganese, this is actually an, a manganese plus seven. Now, if you remember oxidation numbers, and if you don't, by the way, it's okay, but if you do, oxygen is negative two, like almost all the time, and there's four of them. So four times negative two is negative eight. Now, the overall species has a negative one charge. So if there's negative eight from the oxygens, that means the manganese is a plus seven. This is gonna be somewhat useful to us because going from a positive seven to a positive two is another way to see that, hey, this is a redox reaction. Remember, if something is oxidized, that means that something's reduced. So you have to have two species at least uh, kind of moving around here. So these numbers right here are just the oxidation numbers. Iron's easy to see, just positive two. The manganese, a little funkier, but it's plus seven. And then over here you see the positive two, positive three. There's a handout on the website, Redox Reactions Handout, and it will go over this material in more detail. So if you're starting to get stuck on this stuff, definitely check it out. The purple solution is aqueous potassium permanganate. The colorless solution contains iron two plus ions. When we combine them, a redox reaction occurs. The permanganate ion is reduced to manganese two plus and the iron is oxidized to iron three plus ion. Cool. Redox reactions are usually pretty spectacular. Um, <clears throat> in this case, you can see the dark, which is kind of a dark purple permanganate. The dark purple totally goes away. The colorless liquid of the iron becomes kind of a slightly off yellow. Iron plus three sometimes is that way. Um, so redox reactions are pretty cool. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Okay, so the first question, uh, this question then says, what's the oxidation number on the vanadium ion? <clears throat> so this is a vanadium complex, and to figure out the oxidation number, remember oxidation numbers are kind of like charges for metals, and <clears throat> oxidation numbers can be super helpful for transition metals. We don't usually know transition metals off the top of our heads. They can be different kind of values but we can figure out what the vanadium is by remembering that there's the most important oxidation numbers. Oxygen is almost always minus two, and hydrogen almost always plus one. So there are two negative two oxygens for negative four. The overall molecule here has a plus one. So in Chem 221, sometimes I would do the oxidation number of vanadium, plus two times the oxidation number of oxygen equals plus one. We're trying to figure out what the oxidation number of vanadium is. Oxygen is almost always negative two. So you can see here that the only thing we don't know is the oxidation number of vanadium. So negative four plus x equals plus one. Put the negative four on the other side, it becomes a positive four. This particular vanadium is a plus five. The sum of all the oxidation numbers equals the ionic charge, if anything. It was something we did back in Chem 221, which I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, so you don't have to say anything, but in this case, that means the oxidation number of the vanadium plus two times the oxidation number of oxygen equals plus one and you almost always know something besides the main weird one. Vanadium is the main weird one here. So, so in this case, that's how you can get to the oxidation number of vanadium as well as Any questions? Okay, 
So let's go. Copper metal reacts spontaneously with a solution of silver nitrate. A coating of silver metal forms on the copper, while copper 2 plus ions, which are blue in water, are released into the solution. So this is that reaction I showed earlier, where copper metal, which is the thin copper uh, wire, it's reacting with silver ions. We end up with the kind of bluish copper 2 plus and the mossy silver. So I'm going to use this reaction as an example of how to balance equations. And some of these steps are a little tedious, all right? But if you go through these steps each time, you'll have no problem balancing these crazy equations. So bear with me. Some of this part, especially in this example, is going to be kind of like a duh. But I want to go through the steps so that when we get to more complicated examples, they'll make, they'll make more sense later. So if we wanted to balance this reaction right here, all right. First thing we got to do is break up the reaction into two half reactions. So we're trying to figure out what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. And you don't have to know at this level what's being oxidized and reduced. So at the very least, you'd want to break up copper and copper 2 plus, and you'd want to have silver plus and silver. Now if you know that they're oxidized and reduced, cool, but you don't have to. All right, you just want to put the like species together. So both of these have copper and both of these have silver. Now we can kind of figure out here that this is being oxidized because it's becoming more positive relative to the reactant. And the reduced part here is becoming less positive, more negative. But you don't have to know that part of this level. It'll come out naturally if you've done it right. The second step is just to balance each of those half reactions for mass. And this one's already done. Like we have one copper on the left and one copper on the right, cool. One silver on the left, one silver on the right, cool. So there's nothing to do with this step. But if you had like two silvers on this side, you'd want to add a two to that side kind of thing. Um, the next part though is kind of cool. Well, you want to balance the half reactions for charge because like I said earlier, a reaction will be balanced for not just mass but charge and this is why I'm making such a big deal that everybody writes charges on this stuff. Neither of these reactions is balanced for charge. Like this side is positive 2 and this side doesn't have a charge and they should be equal, alright? This side has a positive 1 and this side doesn't have any charge so that's not balanced either. The only thing you can do at this level, though, is add negative electrons. You can't subtract them, you can't add H+, plus. you have to add negative electrons. So what that means is you're going to add negative electrons to the more positive side. So for the first one, then, if we add two negative electrons to the positive two copper side, then we've got positive 2 and negative 2. All of this side goes to 0, and that's what we want. So the copper is going to need 2 electrons to make it balanced for charge. The other one, you're going to add 1 negative electron to the silver plus side, because then you've got positive 1 and negative 1, which goes to 0. And that's good, because silver is 0. If you didn't know before what was being oxidized and reduced, you can naturally figure it out at this level because one species should be losing electrons, i.e. electrons will be products, and the other species should be gaining electrons. Electrons will be reactants. At this level, too, you must have electrons on one product side and one on the reactant side. You, did, you wouldn't want to have them both on the product side or both on the reactant side. Any questions on that? Sweet. All right, the next part, electrons are kind of seen as messy when chemists write out uh, reactions. And our final reaction should not have any electrons showing. So the next step, we're just going to make sure that the electrons on the product side for the one reaction are equal to the electrons on the reactant side for the other. So the copper side, which had the oxidizing or the reducing agent, the copper had two electrons on the product side, 
and the silver plus only had one electron on that side. So we're going to multiply the uh, reduction side, or the oxidizing agent, by two. So we're going to have two silver pluses and two electrons, making two silvers. And again, we're doing that just to make the electrons uh, the same on both sides. So that when we add them together, the electrons will go away. If we had a 2 and a 3, we'd have a common denominator of 6 we would use. Anything you need so that in the next phase, when you add those reactions together, electrons go away. Is that cool? Question. Last step, add them together, make sure the electrons are gone. You want the two electrons on the product side to cancel the two electrons on the reactant side. No electrons in the final piece. So at the end, we have copper plus two silver plus, making copper two plus and two silvers. And at this point, if you're like, oh man, I'm not feeling very confident about it, by all means, go back and check that your final reaction is balanced for mass and charge. So mass, one copper, one copper, balanced. Two silvers, two silvers, balance. So mass, good to go. But the newer player on the block here is that on the reactant side, copper doesn't have a charge, but there's two positive ones. So the reactant side has an overall positive two charge. The product side has a positive two copper, and there's no charge on the silver. So the product side has positive two as well. So positive two on the left, positive two on the right, this reaction is balanced for charge and mass, which is kind of what we're after. Now this reaction wasn't super hard or anything like that. You've probably, probably done this already. Uh, but if you go through these steps, it'll work in literally any scenario. And that's what's kind of cool about these things. Any questions? The next reaction, we're going to look at that vanadium complex I had the question on earlier. It's a vanadium plus five. Vanadium was named after the Swedish goddess, I think it's Vanitas, the goddess of beauty. And one reason why they did that is because vanadium makes incredibly cool colors, just really beautiful colors. Transition metals are always awesome when it comes to colors. Vanadium and chromium right next door are some of the nicest metals, I think, for color. But anyway. Uh, vanadium makes several different complexes, all right? This is a vanadium plus four. I think that's what we're going to talk about. Vanadium plus three, vanadium plus two. So anyway, this is just a reaction that happens. Zinc is often a good source of electrons. So we're going to take the vanadium and add some electrons to it to make one of these other complexes. All right, so here's a reaction we're going to balance. And we're also going to balance this reaction in acidic solution, all right? And this reaction has that vanadium plus five thing we talked about earlier, plus zinc. It makes this vanadium complex plus zinc two plus. Now, when you first look at a problem like this, you should think about, is it a redox reaction? And the zinc is easy to tell that you bet this is redox because zinc is going from a zero to a positive two. It's changing its charge. You can do it with vanadium too. Like this is a vanadium plus five. Oxygen in this problem is negative two, overall positive two. This is a vanadium plus four. So it's a little harder to see, but this vanadium is also changing, going from a positive five to a positive so for all of these reasons, this is redox. Electrons are being transferred. So let's see if we can figure out how to balance it. So the first step is just to write the two half reactions. And again, you don't have to know which is oxidized or reduced. Um, usually you can just visually see which two go together. So zinc and zinc two plus, that seems like a no brainer. And you can probably see that the two vanadium complexes will go together. Now again, uh, zinc going to zinc two plus is easy to see the charges. This is the vanadium plus five we did on the board earlier. And because oxygen's negative two, technically this is the vanadium plus four. 
So we absolutely have metals changing their charges. This is becoming more positive. This is becoming less positive. So because this is becoming more positive, it's losing electrons being oxidized. This one has to be gaining electrons reduced. But again, don't worry so much about that at this point. You just want to make sure that you get the two like species together. Now, the next part is balancing for mass. The zinc, no problem, all right? Because one zinc on the left, one zinc on the right. But this one now, we're definitely gonna have to think about balancing for mass because there's two oxygens on the left and only one oxygen right here. Now, this step right here, when you balance for mass, pay attention to the acid or base content. This one is an acid. And we're gonna see in a little bit that if you have an acid, you can add water and H plus. So we need more oxygen on the product side. And if we can add H plus or water under acidic solution, that means we're gonna add a water to the product side. But now that we've added water, two oxygens and two oxygens are good, but now we have hydrogens. So because it's an acid, we can add H plus as well. So 2H plus plus VO2 plus makes VO2 plus plus water is balanced for mass. But the important thing here is that in acid, you add H plus and water. Those are the things you add if you're in acid. It's different if you're in base. In base, you would add hydroxide and water. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But in acid, in pH is less than seven. H plus and water can be added. Okay. So now that we've got the reactions balanced for mass, the next thing to do is to add the electrons to make the charges balance. Now zinc doesn't have a charge. Zinc is positive two on the product side. We can only add negative electrons. We'll add two negative one electrons to the product side. Then we've got positive two and negative two, which goes to zero. Zinc is zero. Everything is good to go. The next one's a little bit funkier to see, but we have positive two on the product side. This is the only species with a charge. And ignoring the electron for a minute, the reactant side, you've got a positive one there and two positive ones. So there's like positive three from all of these and a positive two right there. So remembering we only add negative electrons, we're gonna add electrons to the more positive side, we're gonna add one electron right there. And if you do that, you then have negative one plus two plus one more. That gives an overall positive two on the reactant side. And that's good because the product side has a positive two as well. So they're both balanced for charge. Questions on that? Always add electrons to the more positive side. Okay, the next step is we wanna make sure that when we add the reactions together, the electrons go away. So in this case, you can see there's two electrons in the zinc, but only one electron on the vanadium side. So we're gonna multiply the vanadium side through by two. So two electrons, four H plus, two VO2 plus ones makes two VO2 pluses plus two waters. And we do that because the last step, when we add them together, we don't want any electrons to show. Now that there are two electrons on the reactant side here and two electrons on the product side there, we can add those two together and you end up with zinc plus 4H plus plus 2VO2 plus makes zinc 2 plus plus 2VO2 plus plus two waters. At the end, you can always go through and make sure that it's balanced for mass and charge. So one zinc, one zinc, four hydrogens, four hydrogens, 
2 plus 2, 4 oxygens. 2 times 2, 4 oxygens. The atoms are the same. Charge, positive 4 and positive 2, positive 6. And on the product side, positive 2, 2 times 2, positive 4, so positive 6 overall. Everything's balanced. Pop that off. These are easy, but you do need to practice them, just to make sure. They're not hard, but spend a little time just figuring out how it all works out and stuff like that. And that handout, the Redox Guide, will give some examples of how this works. Um, again, it's not difficult, it's just a little weird at first, so try and practice a little bit. Questions? Okay. So the question is, on this problem, how many electrons are flowing from the tin to the silver plus? Now tin is, doesn't have any uh, charge, but here tin is a positive 2. And here the two silvers are plus 1, and here two silvers are neutral. So silver is becoming less positive, tin more positive. That means that electrons are flowing, first of all. And it's flowing from the part that's becoming more positive, tin, to the part which is becoming less positive, which is silver. And if you ever see a question like this, um, the easiest way in this problem would be just to look at the tin, because electrons have to be balanced on both sides. So tin is going to tin 2 plus, that means tin is losing two electrons. So that would be the easiest way by far to see that two electrons are flowing. But you could do it from the silver too, like silver plus is going to silver, and there's two of them. So there's two electrons going to each silver plus to make silver. Any questions? If you're balancing problems in base, there are actually two different methods to use to balance a redox reaction in base. I'm going to go through the accepted one, and then I'm going to show you what I call Michael's method, which is the way that works for me, and it's longer, which I don't like, but I always have a problem doing it the classic way. So Michael's method, which I'll talk about later, is a longer way, but it works for me 100% of the time. And the initial method sometimes gets a little bit strange. So anyway, this reaction has a permanganate ion, and MnO4 2 minus is called manganate. It's a weird polyatomic ion. And this thing right here is a peroxide, and it's going to oxygen. Now, definitely something's going on here, because permanganate to manganate have different charges. So this is redox. This one's also going to be in base. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But to start this kind of reaction off, a redox reaction in base, same thing, write out the half reactions, the things that look similar. So the permanganate and the manganate definitely go together. Also the peroxide and the oxygen go together. And by the way, peroxides are one time where oxygen has a negative one uh, oxidation number, so it's a little bit weird. Uh, and the other one, of course, would be the permanganate. Now, if you figure out the charges here, permanganate is positive 7, and manganate is plus 6. So this side is going to be reduced, and this side is going to be oxidized. But again, you don't really have to know about this at this point. As long as you see that the manganese pieces go together, and the oxygen pieces go together, you're totally cool. Now, when you balance for mass, all right, then manganate and permanganate, those are balanced, one manganese and four oxygens. But it's the other one I want to talk about. In base, you can have hydroxide and water. So acid was H plus in water. Per, uh, basic would be hydroxide and water. And for this one, if you're missing out on hydrogen, you add water to the hydrogen deficient side. So for example, this side has a has an hydrogen and this side has no hydrogen. So we're going to add water to the hydrogen deficient side and you'd add hydroxide to the other side. And if, if you do that, 
two oxygens plus one oxygen from one hydroxide, that's three O's. And the product side has two plus one, three O's. And sure enough, one plus one, two hydrogens, two hydrogens. So if you can make this work, where you add water to the hydrogen deficient side and hydroxide to the other side, you're good to go. And you won't need my Michaels method, which I'll talk about later. But the punchline is, is that for a basic reaction, you can't have H plus around. You have to have hydroxide and water. In an acid, you could have H plus and water. Any questions on that? Okay. For charge, this side has negative 1 and negative 1, negative 2, and oxygen and water are neutral, so we'll add two electrons to that side to make that happen. For the other one, we'll add one electron to the permanganate side. This is negative 2, and permanganate's negative 1, so the charge again is not balanced. We'll add an electron to that side to make both sides negative 2. The next step is we want to make sure that the electrons are the same on both sides. You can probably see that this side will multiply by 2 to make the electrons cancel out. So we'll multiply the permanganate side by 2 because this last step will take the two electrons there and the two electrons there and will cancel them out so they won't show. So you add these two half reactions together, get rid of the electrons, Hydroxide plus the peroxide plus two permanganate makes oxygen plus water plus two permanganate. And sure enough, if you go through it, you'll find that the atoms, the mass, is the same on both sides, and the charges are the same on both sides. Like you've got negative one, negative one, and negative two, so negative four overall. Two times negative two, negative four overall. And again, if you can do this, add water to the hydrogen deficient side and hydroxide to the other side, you'll be good to go. But I sometimes have a problem with this. And after we take a break, I'll show you so-called Michael's method, which I use to figure these things out.